back to the, the theme, you know, so far for the TED Talk, and that it is to construct, to deconstruct, to rebuild. And so when you look at the order in which that appears, it seems to be very logical. But really, there is also something suspiciously irrational about the way that it appears. So to be more specific, why would we construct something only to deconstruct it later on, to take it apart? What is the purpose in building it? And so I go back to 1966. And on October 21st, the famous French philosopher Jacques Derrida had given a speech there, a lecture there. And in the audience at John Hopkins University, there are very famous prof uh, professors, philosophers there who were also present. And this included Roland Barthes, Michel Foucault, and, uh, and of course, uh, Paul de Mon. And so they're listening to him speak, and he is making this uh, shocking declaration. And it, and it goes back to that point you know, that has been discussed so far. And, and what he says is that there is absolutely no meaning. Language has no meaning. That um, a structure has no meaning to it. So what he's addressing and going back to is to uh, the late 19th century philosopher, Ferdinand uh, Saussure, who's uh, another French philosopher. But his point was on structuralism. And his argument is that, well, you know, you have to have a structure, that only a structure that we produce is something that also produces meaning. And Derrida, this many years later, is arguing that, no, it doesn't. And again, this becomes very shocking because if you don't have any meaning, then what really is a purpose to life? You know, so, and it gets into now, what specifically is deconstruction? What exactly does that mean? And he is arguing that the way in which you find meaning is that you have to tear something apart. You have to take it apart. You have to break it apart in order to discover and understand what that meaning is. So I go to the use of language, you know, that, that words mean something to us. They, have an, they can have an emotional impact on us, you know, depending upon what that word is, but also it relies quite a bit on what our experience is and how we attach our experience to the signification of that particular word. But what Derrida is arguing is this, is that language is not fixed. There is no finality to a particular word. What Saussure had argued was this, is that a word is a unit. And when we string words together to form a sentence, that it constructs rules. So again, we have a certain rule that is constructed by, by language, by, by words themselves. But now let's look at it this way and try to understand exactly what Derrida was arguing here. So I can take a word like peace, and what Derrida claims is that that word has, it, it doesn't have one signified meaning. It has several signified meanings that can continue on for an eternity. So again, the dictionary definition of the word peace is freedom from a disturbance. Okay, fine. But now you take the word freedom, well, what exactly does freedom mean? And freedom means the power and the right to express my own idea, to take action, to think independently. Okay? So now what does a word power mean? Power means the ability to influence others or to influence behavior. All right? Now we go on to influence. Well, what does influence mean? Influence means the development of a certain behavior, the effect of a behavior, to have an effect on one's behavior. What does effect mean? It means change as a result of a cause. It can go on forever. You know, so, so again, it, the, we go back to that question. So how is it that understanding how language can be signified and has a string of signifiers, how does that lead to deconstruction? How is it that I can actually understand meaning by taking something apart? And so um, I want to reference the book uh, by Toni Morrison, Sula. And, um, you know, the book starts around uh, right after World War I. And you have the leading character, Shadrach, and the opening scene is him coming back from Europe, and he is completely shell-shocked. And the home to which he returns is Medallion, Ohio, which is a small town in the Midwest. And it is a community of African Americans, and they live in a section of Medallion that is called The Bottom. 
But the bottom really isn't at the bottom of you know, that area. It's actually on a hilltop. But that hilltop is very arid. There's not a lot of growth around that particular part. But it's called the bottom. And once again, we go back to what, does, what do words mean? You know, what does language mean? And when Shadrach comes back, he is shell-shocked. In his way, his method of uh, dealing with this and trying to assimilate back into his community is by having what is called National Suicide Day. And what he does is he comes out with a sign one day a year, and he asks anyone who wants to commit suicide to come follow him along. And this really unrattles that community, you know, the first time that it happens. But then as time goes on, as years progress, it becomes kind of almost like a, a convention within their culture. You know, that, uh, that again, they arrange their, if they're trying to plan out something that week, well, it's close to National Suicide Day, so I know we have to take care of it in advance. You know, it becomes kind of part of their institution. In other words, the actual meaning of suicide in that particular community, it would be beneath them, you know, that they are not victims. And so, you know, and that is a signifier of, of suicide, but they, re, they turn that word around. And the way in which that word is used within that community is they are rebelling against convention. They are rebelling against the signified meaning of suicide. As the story progresses, it really focuses on two young girls, Nell and Sula, and they are best friends from the time that they meet as, as small children. And then a tragic event happens where Sula, who comes from a very kind of unconventional way of life, you know, her mother is unmarried, she grows up with her grandmother. Her grandmother actually had her leg cut off by a train so she could collect the insurance money to help support her family. Whereas Nell comes from a home in which it is the epitome of convention. Two parents that have been together since a, for a long time, they have a normal family life, in terms of, again, the emphasis on school and education. And, uh, and, it, and it appears on the surface that everything is exactly as it should be, according to the nuclear family. But that is not how Sula lives. These two girls who come from very different backgrounds, they become best friends. And on one of those afternoons when they're coming home from school, Sula picks up a small child and starts swinging him around as a way of playing with him and they are near a river, and Sula unfortunately lets the child slip out of her hands, and the child ends up in a river and drowns. And they basically, the two girls stand there and they watch them drown, they are paralyzed, they don't know what to do. They forget the event, and they leave the scene, and after that, their relationship is never the same. So eventually, when they become young women, it is Nell who settles down and gets married and has children, and stays in Medallion, Ohio, but at the age of 18, it is Sula who takes off and leaves, and she goes to the big city, and she has this other life that she creates. And 10 years later, all of a sudden, there she is. She shows up back in medallion, and she is dressed to the hilt, and there is, there is a lot of suspicion that revolves around her because she doesn't look like a 30-year-old. She looks like she's still young, and, uh, and she's not married, and she doesn't have any children, and here she is coming back, and, of course, all the townspeople are very alert and aware of what she was like when she was a child. You know, that when, again, when she was bullied, she did not react in fear. She reacted by taking her finger and cutting it off and telling her bullies that if you think I can do this to myself, just think what I can do to you. But it's always a reaction of fear. And so, uh, so when she comes back to Medallion, she moves in with her grandmother, Eva, and, uh, and Eva is uh, questioning her, how come you're not married? How come you don't have any children? How come, you don't, how come you never had babies? And Sula's response is this. She says, I don't want to make other people. I want to make myself. And again, this, uh, and, you know, by this time it's 1937, you know, very different culturally and socially compared to how we live now in the 21st century. When you think about the roles of men and women, you know, women are not pursuing more independent lives at that point. So she and Nell are reunited, and they start spending time together. And as things turn out, uh, Sula ends up having an affair with Nell's husband, Jude. And Jude leaves, and Jude never comes back. 
And uh, Sula, by that point, has already had a bad reputation of taking other women's husbands and having affairs with them. But unlike her mother, who did the same thing, Sula does the cruelest thing of all. When she has an affair with them, she leaves them, and she never bothers with them again. And so we go to her name, Sula, and her last name is Peace. And when we look at her behavior and her actions, it is something that is defined as discord and chaos. You know, we automatically as a reader assume that she is bringing chaos to other people's lives. But that's not in fact what happens. You know, and again, it goes back to that question of language. You know, how could a character that is regarded as being purely evil, you know, bring about peace within that community? And uh, it is because that when she rejects those husbands, they go back home to their wives and their wives, instead of feeling disregarded and dismissed and cheated on, they start feeling compassion for their husbands and they start taking care of them like they never did before. And the husbands end up becoming better fathers to their children. They don't drink. They get jobs. They make money. They participate within the house. What Sula does is she ironically establishes order within that community. You know, again, it is to take something apart and to understand internally how it actually works and how it operates. And you can only understand that when you examine each component and you begin to carefully put it back together to rebuild. But Sula ends up making the biggest mistake that she could make. She violates her own code and she ends up falling in love with someone. And he is the one who eventually leaves her. And she is wise enough and experienced enough to realize that he's never coming back. And at that point she gives up and she ends up dying. And it is Nell who comes and visits her before she departs this world. You know, and even when we get to death, you know, Morrison makes this a really important and interesting claim and it is that, you know, death does not happen by accident. Life happens by accident, but death is something that is very deliberate. And we see that with her. It becomes her choice. You know, that that one love affair and that one event becomes so powerfully moving and so emotional that she can't recover from it, neither emotionally or spiritually or physically. And she's gone. And so we look at, you know, and, and, and I, I guess I want to close on this and, you know, thinking about a novel like that and also thinking about you know, with, uh, with all these different, um, you know, social examples, you know, that have been discussed. And, uh, and perhaps, you know, for a long time at the academic level, you know, we will take those, um, you know, very complex assumptions and we try to understand how they apply to the social order, how they apply to conventions. And, and sometimes they don't go very well examined. You know, there's something that is left out and perhaps it is a process of deconstructing something. You know, and in the use of that word, I want to use a different word in this case. It is to demystify it, to understand it, to demystify it. In other words, to, um, to identify the mystery and therefore it no longer is mysterious, it is familiar to us. And uh, there is no way of being you know, familiar unless we're actually willing to explore. And so, you know, and especially if we depend on convention too much, you know, going back to the character Nell, Nell depends on those conventions because she honestly believes that's what's going to make her a good person. And what we see is that it leads to a very limited perspective, a very narrow view. And what we hear today is that we, we have to do away with those narrow perspectives, maybe be more conscientious about how we use language. And with that, if, if, if we look at ourselves, and that is, you know, as, as a student, that um, maybe the purpose is more than just simply learning and becoming more advanced within a specialized field, but I think what it urges us to do is to try to live a more examined life. Thank you.